Hello, welcome to our next section. It is simply called Evidence. We've been talking about natural selection. Uh, we've been talking about uh, a mechanism that's been proposed for how evolution works. What is the evidence that evolution actually occurs and actually takes place? We're going to look at that in this, um, in this section here. We're going to look at the fossil record again. <laughs> we talk a lot about that. We're going to look at uh, molecular and genetic data um, to, to uh, give us some indication that evolution is something that is at work. We're going to look at homologies, homologous structures, and um, also the environment and ecology, and uh, look at different those different pieces of evidence that point to evolution. First, let's look at fossils. Again, the fossil record. It's kind of fun to look at that since we usually... Um, associate fossils with um, earth science. We get to talk a little bit about that here. Here are just a bunch of different words associated with fossils. Uh, paleontology, in case you didn't know, is just the study of fossils. If you want to be a paleontologist and study fossils, um, that's what you would call yourself. To date, there are approximately 250,000 different species of uh, fossil organisms that have been found. And that's a lot of different species. However, scientists estimate that only one in 10,000 different extinct species have actually been discovered. So there are a lot of different species out there that have not even been discovered that we don't even know about yet. So let's look a little bit about different types of fossils very briefly, um, because you've probably done this a little in earth science, trace fossils, where uh, it's a an evidence of uh, the organism. It's not the organism itself, but something like their footprints or um, their excrement or uh, little tunnels that they have burrowed in the ground. They would be fossils that are um, traces of that organism. We have a mold and a cast. Those are different types of fossils. Here's just examples of those. A true form fossil would be the actual bone or the actual, um, here is an actual organism that has been fossilized in amber. Um, it's fossilized tree sap. There are also soft tissue fossils. Um, those are a little more rare, but they're really exciting. Um, in 1999 in Siberia, this is one of those soft tissue fossils that was found. It was a preserved uh, organism of a woolly mammoth that had been frozen um, and uh, the soft tissues are still there to study. Um, woolly mammoths have been extinct for around 10,000 years. There's a just a drawn sketch of what one might have looked like. Here's a picture of uh, one of the two modern living elephant species, the African elephant. Um, this has been a really exciting study. There are a lot of uh, scientists who would like to try and clone um, some woolly mammoth, perhaps try and um, breed them with elephants, breed the clones, um, try and study the DNA. One thing that is a major difference between the woolly mammoth and the elephant, elephant is the number of uh, chromosomes. So interbreeding them may not really be a viable possibility. The uh, mammoth has 58 chromosomes, the elephant only has 56, so that is not... Um, a number that those numbers don't work together to produce at least probably fertile offspring anyway. Another thing to note is that um, when the DNA is studied between uh, the mammoth and the African elephant, there's only about a 5% difference between um, the DNA sequences between the extinct species and this modern species. So with the exception of the soft tissue fossils, um, because those were found frozen in ice, preserved that way, most fossils are found in rocks. Um, what type of rocks do you think they would usually be found in? Here's a diagram right here of the rock cycle, and I was excited to put this in because you've probably already seen this and studied it in earth science, and you know about the rock cycle and the three different kinds of rocks and how they cycle from one to the next. Which ones would you expect to contain the most fossils? Well, sedimentary rocks, that's usually where we find the fossils, and that's because um, fossils don't survive this 
melting process into igneous rocks. Um, they also don't survive the heat and the pressure that transforms them to the metamorphic rocks either. So usually they're found in the sedimentary rock uh, layers. So all this talk about fossils, what is it we were trying to discuss in the first place? Remember, we're looking at what is the evidence for evolution? How are fossils providing this evidence? Um, well, they provide physical records of organisms not found on Earth today, for one. Um, they also, depending on where their placement is in the strata and in the different layers of rocks, they can help scientists determine the relative age of uh, the relative ages of different organisms and ancestral relationships of extinct and living species. Um, when we look at different rock layers, we can see uh, when things existed in time and when things then uh, came along after those organisms. So um, fossils also provide evidence of the rate of evolutionary change. Since we can date the fossils, we can understand when um, different species were alive and uh, the progression again of um, some of those changes over time. So besides the fossil record, we have ecology that uh, gives us evidence for evolution. One interesting idea um, that we see ecologically, we see coevolution happening. Coevolution is um, when different species adapt to each other. Um, and here's an example, different Galapagos tortoises. Here is one tortoise who... Um, feeds, both of them feed on cactus. It, this tortoise, however, um, the food that is available to him are uh, cacti that grow really high on tough woody stems. And so these tortoises have evolved long, long necks and this little flared saddleback shell so that his neck can raise up high to eat the uh, woody stemmed cacti. Here, this tortoise um, does not have that adaptation, and the food that this tortoise eats are, um, he lives on an island where the cacti are low growing, they don't have those woody stems, and so there is no need for his neck to stretch way up to reach the food. He's able to um, eat that uh, low, those low stems on the cacti. This is an example of co-evolution, the development of the woody cactus stems and the flared tortoise shells right here. That's how um, this tortoise and uh, the cacti that have the woody stems, they co-evolved, um, adapting to each other. Another example of that would be toxic plants. Um, many plants produce toxic compounds that protects them uh, from being eaten by different animals. Um, and toxic plants often don't have very many predators. Uh, and very many organisms that eat them, uh, unless they somehow have developed tolerance or um, some kind of adaptation uh, where the organism is not affected by that toxicity. That would be another example of coevolution. Another example um, from ecology is actually a very interesting experiment um, involving mice and barn owls. And there are a lot of different types of experiments like this that have been done. But um, this particular one um, was asking how could predator attacks lead to changes in protective coloration? And you can see here we have um, the mouse that has sort of the, the tan color, the light color, and he's on a gray soil. Here's the gray mouse on this uh, light colored soil. And he obviously blends in with the gray colored soil. This mouse blends in better here. Um, and in an experiment done with uh, mice and owls, who are their predators, uh, gaining lots and lots and lots of data, the owl caught almost twice as many of the mice when they were on the more when they were on their opposite color of soil of sand terrain. So when the dark mice were on the light terrain like this, the owls were catching about double uh, what they normally would catch. And same with the light mouse on the, the uh, darker gray color background. 
the owl was catching almost twice as many more. So you could see or how over time the populations would change. If, uh, if this mouse was in this environment, um, it certainly uh, would change the dynamics if the owl was eating all of these mice as opposed to uh, if, this, if we had populations with natural variations, right, with these mice all on the light soil and these were being selected against by the owl, well, over a long time, we'd end up with mostly a population looking like that mouse. And that is how uh, we can observe uh, by an experiment some changes in um, populations over time. So another uh, source of evidence for evolution would be homologies or homologous structures. And we've talked about this before, so I won't go into it. Here's just a picture that um, I think was in one of our pre even uh, one of our previous videos, um, just showing homologies of the forelimb in six different vertebrates and uh, how those homologous structures lend themselves to uh, supporting evolution. What about genetic evidence? How does that support evolution? Well, this should look really familiar because we just had a test on it. Sources of genetic variation, mutation, crossing over, independent assortment, recombination of the alleles, and sexual reproduction. Um, genetic variation itself is the raw material of evolution. When we have mutation, when we have all of these things contributing to genetic variation, that is the, the uh, key component in um, allowing natural selection to occur so that um, we have evolution and uh, the process of evolution can even happen. Without those sources of genetic variation, we would not have the potential for natural selection because everything would be identical. There would be no, um, no natural selection possible and we wouldn't get evolution. But that genetic variation is indeed what is actually uh, giving rise to the process of evolution uh, via natural selection. And last but not least, molecular data supports um, the theory of evolution. And what do we mean by molecular data? We've talked about this before as well. Uh, we can compare amino acid sequences of homologous proteins in different species. So now that you know what all those big words mean, <laughs> we've had these in different units. Amino acids, you know what those are. Um, the sequence of those amino acids, the, the chain of them that make up the protein. Um, when we take those different chains of amino acids from different species, and, and we're talking about homologous proteins, so we'll look at proteins that have the same um, function in both of those different species and we compare them, we can start to see similarities um, between some species and maybe less similarities between other species. So that gives us an idea of um, some uh, molecular information and things that are going on. We can also compare nucleotide sequences. So where do, where do we find nucleotide sequences? Remember in the DNA. DNA has sequences of nucleotides and we can look at homologous genes again like genes that are coding for kind of some similar traits and we can see how how similar the sequences are the order of those nucleotides between different species then the degree of relatedness between those species um, may correlate with that molecular data here's just an example of a little tiny tiny piece of um, RNA and it's just uh, showing um, some different organisms and uh, the correlation between some of those sections of that RNA between them. So big ideas, things to remember. Remember, what is the evidence for evolution? Evidence for evolution comes from, I really didn't format this right, did I? I should say the evidence for evolution comes from the following. The fossil record comes from ecology. We see evidence in homologies, in genetic evidence, and in molecular evidence. Remember that this is a really, really, really important point right here. Individual organisms do not evolve. So this little cartoon, it's really very inaccurate. It's nothing like what happens in evolution. Individuals do not evolve. Populations evolve. And when we talk about natural selection, we're talking about 
a population changing over time, not an individual organism saying, I am evolving to have this different trait. It is simply the fact that uh, organisms that are uh, better suited, you know, the survival of the fittest, you've heard that phrase, better suited to their environment, they're chosen, chosen in favor of for whatever reason, they are able to produce more offspring that contain their genetically passed on uh, traits and over a long period of time and many, many generations of passing on those favorable traits um, for that particular environment, you end up having a change in the overall uh, dynamics of that population. So here are a few advanced ideas. You can look into what, what are Hox genes, um, what do short repeated nucleotide sequences have to do with evolution. Um, what about pseudogenes? What are those? Why are they not subjected to natural selection? Um, other questions or ideas that you have as we've looked at this, really anything, anything that is of interest to you, um, you can go off on a rabbit trail and research something that um, is a little bit tangential to the topic. That's fine. I would love to see what you have, what you've come up with, and um, I'll see you in class.